Uh, Jacques, it's really good to hear your voice. It's always good to see you. Now it's especially good to hear your voice. The, the wonders of modern technology, but the way there's a will, there is a way. Yes, yes. From We say in Yiddish, from your lips to God's ear. So, <laughs> so uh, Jacques, um, I was uh, remembering that it was just about a year that you and I first met when uh, Tisha James, the Attorney General of the State of New York, and uh, the American Jewish Committee called us together uh, to uh, format a round table of black ministers and rabbis. Uh, a lot has changed since that first meeting. The intention of that first meeting was to repair or to uh, you know, build the bridges between our two communities. But now we're in a different world given everything that's happened in, in the last weeks. Um, and I'd like to begin with a, just in this conversation with really asking something that very often white people are timid about asking uh, people uh, black uh, or people of color. And, and that is, if you could give us some idea of, um, of your history, uh, how your identity was shaped, what is the experience of being black in this country? Uh, in, a, in very particular ways, I think it would be helpful for us in beginning this conversation. Well, first of all, I want to thank all of our viewers slash listeners for their patience and, uh, and, and say that I appreciate the opportunity to help in the bridge building process. Uh, having said that, I'm a native New Yorker. Um, I come from a Caribbean American family. And for much of the, uh, my early years, I was uh, uh, just an American. Uh, it wasn't until Emmett Till's uh, killing which uh, in New York, growing up in, in, at that time we lived in Queens, uh, it was down south. And in, in the south, things were different, I discovered. Uh, but even as a little boy, I remember uh, Emmett Till disappearing in the search for him. And, and I was asking my father upon the discovery of his remains, how could grown men do that to a boy? And if my father had, at, up until that point, he seemed to be able to have the answer to any question about life. But this question, the look on his face is a look that stays with me 60 years later. And it was, it was, he never actually had the words. And at that point, I knew that being black, Negro at that time, meant being something different other. That was my first uh, exposure to other and that it had dangerous consequences, at least in that place down south. Uh, and as, as time passed on and the civil rights movement then began to take steam, uh, I remember when Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman uh, were disappeared and there was a search for their body. Um, and it then took on ominous dimensions because there were certain things that we didn't talk about in certain places. and. I went to an integrated school and uh, I've, I felt different than my classmates in watching the news and watching these experiences and watching my parents' reaction to those experiences. Uh, when we moved back uh, to uh, New York and I went to Dewey Clinton High School, uh, by that point, um, I had in middle school, what is now middle school, played football on an integrated team, um, predominantly white team, but we played against the folks of all colors. And, but something happened between my junior high school and high school. And then many of my friends who were white and, and, and uh, Italian or Jewish, we started to hang around with folks from our community more than other communities. And uh, by the time I was in college, uh, now the 60s were in full, full sway. And uh, in my freshman year in college, Martin Luther King was assassinated. I had met him. Uh, when I was a sophomore in high school. And I, I really realized then that that was the turning point in my life. And uh, the seeds of social activism were planted. Years later, when I joined, when I left the Episcopal Church and joined a, a Baptist church, as God's hand would have it, the church that I joined was the church of a man who had been Martin Luther King's chief of staff. And I went on to become the last person that he ordained. And uh, his legacy ordained of around social justice issues. 
It's a fascinating story. I guess uh, I didn't realize we were in business in high school, and maybe not at the same time, because I went to the school right next to Dewa Clinton. You know, science. Sci science. Okay. Science. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Um, you know, so it's interesting because I, I was listening to your story and I didn't know some of this, obviously. Um, I realized we, we both, we were different ages, but we both grew up in the civil rights era, or what was called then the, the civil rights era. We lived through the 60s and the 70s, which in fact I thought of as the time of the greatest anarchy that we had in this country. Um, but um, tell me what What's different about this time? And I, when I say this time, I'm talking about the last last three weeks, the last four weeks. You know, that makes this this matter of of um, you know racism even more prevalent, and 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 frames it in a very different language. Well, if you if you think back first in the, in the comparison, if you think back to the '60s, when the '60s began. Uh, in 1960, and we're beginning the 20s, if you will. Um, there was the time of the Beatles and Muhammad Ali. Um, there was the um, Ed Sullivan show. Uh, there were all kinds of, there was the new music, and uh, the, it was an age at the beginning of psychedelic and peace and love. Uh, and then as, as things progressed, uh, battle lines were drawn and, and, and different things emerged. Well, in, in this day and age, the most significant thing, I think, is when, particularly if you look in the last three weeks, if you look at the demonstrators, the overwhelming, the, the, the large participation of uh, a rainbow, a literal rainbow coalition of young people. Uh, and it's not, it used to be that there were whites. There were whites in the civil rights movement. And when John Lewis was beaten in the bus station, there were whites who had their skulls fractured. In fact, but the difference today, Peter, I think, is those whites were, uh, they walked the line in the white community. There were many whites who called them all kinds of names, ostracized them, criticized them, called them communist travelers and, and many other things that we won't repeat here. But the fact of the matter is being white and in the civil rights movement uh, was, it carried great risk and peril. Today, uh, the young people are leading and they are from all communities. And they are changing grandparents' minds and grandparents' hearts, um, much the way the people who first saw Obama went and changed their grandparents. You remember that when Obama first was running, he was not the favorite. Uh, and, and Ted Kennedy's granddaughter convinced him that this, this is somebody you need to be a part of or to be on the right side of history. The young people today are saying that we listen to all the things that your generation was telling us. And we've actually embodied it, and, and we're going to march on those issues, and we're going to stand up on those issues. The other thing is that uh, the financial uh, circumstance of America, 43 million people are out of work, and 110,000 people have just died since New Year's Eve. And so those two elements uh, have changed the, the paradigm of America. So people who were quarantined were sitting home watching in the last three weeks, they were watching policemen beat other Americans up. They were watching the president of the United States retreat to a bunker. Um, so America absorption of the news and the, and the latest events have changed the climate in America. So that people are beginning to ask the fundamental questions. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about it, and I, I, you know, I shared with you, and in fact, uh, if it gets printed, you're going to be, uh, you know, we're going to be co-signers in this. That if if what happened, uh, you know, with uh, George Floyd, and if what happened with uh, uh, Ahmoud Arbery was not captured on cell phone, uh, I wonder if this kind of what you were talking about, the coalition, the coalescing. Of young people to come together uh, would would have happened. In other words, it, it took some kind of evidence that could not be debated uh, to focus. I think this matter of racism. Well, it, it, it is clear that social media and technology have changed America. Uh, when in, in 2008, when President Obama was organizing, he out organized the opposition on social media. Uh, social media is a new fact of life and. It touches us in ways that are very personal. Um, we've seen other folks. We saw Rodney King get beat. We saw uh, a lot of other people uh, be victims of violence. But this was so personal and so extended. And 
when Aubrey got shot, we saw that. Uh, but we actually heard George Floyd's cries. And as much as the visual uh, was impactful, I think the, the essence of when he called out for his mother, it touched a nerve in America that's been different. And then you switch to Buffalo, and the 75-year-old man goes and touches a police officer, and he's knocked to the ground, and then 50 men walk by him. I do think that, that uh, that's the latest episode, but for, you know, we saw uh, Eric Garner, but these things have touched young people, and they say we're going to do something about it. And here's the other thing, Peter. When you, we saw these things in each instance, when the police filed their official reports, they submitted something that was different than reality. And that gap is, is at the heart, I think, of the uh, hypocrisy and the outrage that people are expressing. Well, I, you know, I agree with you that the, the discussion is different, but, uh, you know, I, I was thinking how difficult the, the discussion of racism still is. Um, you know, as a matter of fact, there have been a couple of articles in the, you know, in the papers recently, uh, one of which uh, said, uh, I don't need your love text dressed with guilt. Uh, here's how you can help. In other words, that was, you know, Chad Sandler's in the New York, uh, Sanders in the New York Times. I mean, I think in certain ways, people are tiptoeing around, still tiptoeing around the issue and um, and whether, you know, what does it mean to be a racist and am I a racist? And, you know, how do I change that? Well, yeah, uh, you know, when you said uh, at one time, if you said somebody was a racist, that meant that they had a Klan hood in the closet uh, or an axe handle or something of that nature or a, a Confederate flag. Uh, now it's much more personal. And uh, we've been engaging in this difficult conversation. People get very defensive, uh, number one, but because it's difficult to find the language. Uh, imagine, if you, you, again, comparing then and now, when, when it was said in the 60s, black is beautiful, uh, there were people who, who reacted with outrage to that. Uh, uh, when we said black power, there were people who said, are you trying to take over from white people? Do you hate us? Uh, and so now when people say black lives matter, there are people who get, well, all lives matter. Blue right. lives matter. Uh, um, and, and, and I think that that, if, if I had to use a kind of a litmus test, if black lives, if the assertion that black lives matter disturbs you, then that is at least the first gut check that, somehow or another you've been infected by by white supremacy yeah. um, um and and so that is uh, at least i think a point of departure to have a, a difficult conversation but the point is that rather than than have the conversation as a finger pointing exercise i think we need to look forward uh and to, uh, with a glance backwards as to where we've come from but let's move forward. The young people have gotten past that question. Um, they don't have any problems standing on a corner with a sign with no black people present and saying black lives matter because they've in, in, embraced the values that are reflected in that statement. And it, it reflects for them a sign of change. Others are, are invested in status quo. And so when they hear black lives matter, they're like, what are you saying to me? Do I have to give up something? Uh, and that's, I think, uh, Peter, at the crux of this difficult conversation. You know, this is, a, it's kind of a gut check for me, uh, uh, Jacques, because, um, you know, as you know, I'm not in New York City right now. We've, we've been up in New Hampshire and my wife and I uh, went to a protest uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, which was amazing. Firstly, it was primary, I mean, I was the oldest by two, right, by twice, <laughs> probably the next oldest. Um, and, and somebody was holding, handing out Black Lives Matter. And without even thinking, I took it, a, a button that you could wear, I took it. Now, that would not have been the case, I would say, uh, a year or two ago, because whereas I believed in the movement, I didn't like the organization. At one point, the Black Lives Matter organization you know, came out with a, a mission statement that, in fact, was, from my perception, anti-Israel. So you know, this intersectionality became confusing. But this time there was a, I, I find a purity in, in the movement that is different from the way it was being impacted, uh, you know, in, in past years. And, and Black Lives Matter, I think, means something different now than it did when it, we first began, when it first began. 
Well, I, 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 I said at the beginning, because when Black Lives First Matter first came out, there were those on the right who called it the the, uh, the next generation of black the Black Panthers, a militant organization that hated police. Uh, and many blacks embraced it just for the conscience. Never read the mission statement, never read uh, some of the things, because there were other things in the mission statement that put off what I would call mainstream black Christians if they had read it. But it was the notion of Black Lives Matter. It was such a simple declarative affirmation that blacks immediately embraced it. Um, and, and then it kind of percolated. Uh, by that, I mean uh, circumstances and events brought it center stage. So now corporations and elected officials saying give to Black Lives Matter. When in the past, it would have been a, a, a marker of, of uh, disdain to see that you gave to Black Lives Matter. Uh, but now, as you said, it, it, it's more idealistic. Uh, people have embraced it. One of, the, one of the challenges that they faced initially is that they didn't have a traditional structure. And they traditionally, so they said a lot of harsh things about the black church uh, that made them an anathema to many of, of my generation and many mainstream uh, blacks in church. Uh, and there are still reconciliation issues within the organization Black Lives Matter. But the concept, the concept is bigger than they are. Yeah. You know, it's, a, it's interesting. You and I both went to public schools uh, growing up. And, and in New York, um, even though we lived, at least in, you know, in the Bronx, I grew up in the Bronx, which I you know, say is the only borough God cared enough about to put on the mainland. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, that we, there weren't, there weren't uh, interspersed communities. There weren't interracial communities. There were, you know, there was, I knew we knew where the Italians lived. We knew where the Jews lived. We knew where the blacks lived. We knew where the Latinos lived. We, we each had our area, but it was the public schools that became in a certain way, the town square for us. Now, I remember in junior high school, um, I don't know if you ever played in my kids, uh, the parents of my kids I used to teach hated when I taught the game to their kids. It was called Johnny on the Pony. It was kind of, a, the right, kind of a rough sport. But, you know, we would have intramural Johnny on the Pony contest. Uh, mm -hmm. But we, there, there was that integration, you know, kind of a natural integration. It wasn't, it wasn't forced. And yet, I don't think, when I think about it, I never had dinner at a friend, a black friend's house. You know, we, 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 you know, we were cordial, we knew each other, but the, the level of knowing each other differently um, is, is I, I think it's still a struggle in, in our society today. Well, they, they, they were, uh, I, I think that is most people's experience. Uh, it was not my experience. I had a, I had white friends and, but, but the deal was I always went to their house. Uh, and uh, and I did overnight in their house. Uh, at Diva Clinton, we had something called the Leadership Weekends, and they would select students who had some promise, and we would go away for a weekend to a, a retreat a state, uh, upstate New York. And uh, it was supposed to be once, you went once during your school year, and I went like 22 times. So I, I went and, and saw faculty uh, on the weekend. And, uh, and and formed relationships, but the reality was there were always boundaries. Uh, there were there were residential boundaries, there were organizational boundaries. But because I was in the Boy Scouts, that was an organization where at that time that uh, it was as colorblind as as one could get it in in that environment. Until we got to a certain age, and then it was like, okay, we have to go our separate ways now. Uh, mm -hmm. So that that is still. How do we get together? And the young people again are showing us the way, because if you look, if you look in these demonstrations, they are making active, assertive efforts to connect with one another. They are connected in some form or fashion, even if it is united in this moment. But you can see that they have an affinity that uh, that is motivate a motivated affinity uh, rather than being passive and complacent. Yeah, there was an article, um, you know, again, I, um, let me try to adjust this camera so that I'm not, um, there was an article in the pen, Charles, Charles Blow uh, wrote a, a column uh, on a white allies, don't fail us again. And 
The subtext was who will amplify us when their privilege is threatened. In other words, and I don't want to be the cynic, you know, in this conversation, but you know, I guess when you live enough and you've seen enough cycles, um, you know, there are legitimate questions that are asked. You know, how long is this going to last? What, what is the durability of this, in my mind, rather exquisite mo moment? Well, if you remember, because you and I have, have seen some exquisite moments, do you remember the Saturday after Trump was elected, the Me Too moment exploded? There were demonstrations in the city, women wearing these hats. It wasn't just in the U.S., and we were going to show them, and, and the Me Too moment kind of extinguished. It meant, there's a new consciousness, but it's not, no laws were passed, no po a few uh, HR policies were changed, but the promise uh, it fell short, in my view, of the promise. Uh, in, in, in this moment, um, I remember Parkland, the Parkland shootings, and those kids were going to change gun, gun control. They were going to get new legislation passed, and then they ran into grown folks uh, and cynics. Everybody's out, not out marching. Uh, the naysayers, the NRA, and a whole bunch of other folks are sitting at home, and they're just, they're just uh, waiting this one out. Uh, because we haven't heard a word from Mitch McConnell, not a word. Uh, we have. It hasn't been good, but we've heard. <laughs> uh, but, he, I mean, if when it gets to the point that, that the only good Republican is Mitt Romney, then, this, then um, it, it, it reinforces the notion, let's see what happens. Well, let's see what happens with these young people. How much energy do they have when they get turned around? Right now, the wind is at their back. Um, but it's, it's really up to our generation to start to get to these questions because this issue is about more than police brutality. Absolutely. And, and, and so that to engage in the conversation and the examination that you're discussing, for me, the, the Amy Cooper moment is a, such a significant moment in New York City uh, because her exercise of her perception of white privilege was strident and clear and immediate, uh, and it was club-like. And that's the conversation I think that, that, that we ought to have, and it, it doesn't result in any legislation, it doesn't result in any change of policy, but, but in our hearts, that's how we have to begin. Yeah, and, and the other part of that interchange was the other Cooper, Christian Cooper, who was so gracious and his actually, you know, forgiven and his forgiveness. Um, and, and I wonder, you know, I wonder whether uh, those kinds of conversations, and I wonder if that, that those two people will have, a, a, you know, a, a, an ongoing conversation, but I'm, I'm wondering whether the conversations uh, are going to uh, move in, the, in a direction that's going to bring, bring about the kind of systemic change I think we all realize is needed at this moment. Uh, in other words, there was a Parkland student who said, you know, we've done our work. We, we got people to vote. We got tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. We got people to, to register and vote. And we elected people, and then they went and haven't done anything, right? So, and, and you know, I'm asking you because in a certain way, you're, you're politically savvy. Uh, you know, you, you're, you've been in a certain way part of the system, uh, not, not the, the, the do-nothing system, but you've seen the system. Uh, but so how do we how do we do it? Are we at the at the mercy of lobbyists? Are we at the the mercy of continued elections and campaigns? How do we change this system? Well, you know, I I, I think we sometimes make it more complicated than it is, uh, and complicated by that I mean what we need to do is simple but not easy. Uh, so uh, after the Jersey shoot, the city shootings and a number of anti-Semitic incidents at the end of last year and the beginning of this year. Uh, I, in discussion with some of my friends in the Jewish community, I wanted to do something that said, we care and we feel your pain. And so I gathered a group of black leaders, the head of the NAACP, a black labor leader, a prominent corporate executive, a bunch of, not a bunch, but a group of us went and we worshiped. We didn't, we didn't stop by, we didn't call a press conference. We worshiped with a congregation uh, in the first Sabbath of the new year. And, and, from the expressions, and then we stayed after the worship service to fellowship with the members of the congregation. Each of us is going to have to determine, is going to have to, in order for progress to be made, Peter, I believe, 
we're going to have to get out of our comfort zone and, and do something. So for me, uh, when I was in Israel, I went to Yad Vashem, and I read about the Holocaust, and I knew a lot of things. But when I went there, I could experience pain firsthand and understand the Jewish community and my Jewish brothers and sisters in a much different way. But I had to go halfway across the planet uh, to do that because there was nothing at that time in the New York experience that I could have had that knowledge and, and, and uh, that exposure. Uh, we're going to have to get past our, out of our comfort zone to have some conversations, to, 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 to be intentional about it, because it's not just going to happen because I read the newspapers or I watched the demonstration or even participated in the demonstration. We're going to have to, to be in, uh, move and do things that put us in, in, in the way of an, a different community. And there are a lot of communities that are looking for an embrace or an interaction. Yeah, you know, I, I know I'm going to ask a question that's in a certain way a sideline for most people, but but very central for us, um, which is how much is faith a matter of this for you? It is. If it wasn't for faith, I wouldn't even engage. It would be. It, I could embrace the cynics' conclusions. Uh, but I have seen darker times or experienced darker times and seen us get through it. And I'm convinced that the breath of fresh air that are young people, uh, that we can take their aspirations and mix them and marry them to our experience and our faith to figure our way to, to higher ground. Uh, Donald Trump is nearly, for me, the, the, the villain from central casting because if he was more moderate, if he was more Mitch McConnell, he would be harder to deal with. But he's so clearly a divisive figure. He's so clearly um, hostile to progress that, you know, he's, he's the person you would like to organize. You can get to organize around. He is Bull Connor in the White House. And so for, for a lot of people, the conversation at least starts with at least we have him in common uh, and what he represents. And then we can begin, I think, and hope to lower the decibel level and then and call on our common faith. You know, if we, if we were to have a theological discussion uh, and start in the New Testament, we couldn't get started. But if we can stay in the Old Testament, which we both have in common, we can talk about Micah and Amos and justice. And so I think that we have to be uh, intentional in our pursuit of a better place. Yeah, you know, the as righteousness flows like a mighty stream, you know, the idea is it's not a trickle. Uh, it's how do we, we turn it into a deluge so that uh, we're driven, sometimes in spite of our, our bigotry and our bias, we're driven to do the right thing because I, I think on some level, and I, I think back to my own history, you know, certain, certain, I don't know if it's racist, but certain biases, uh, bias was, was implanted in me uh, you know, as a, as a child and, you know, and, and to be quite forthright, I mean, there are certain Yiddish words that are def defamation, you know, but the, but only the people in the club know what they mean. Right. But, but I, you know, you grow up, you're, you're used to that. And I, I, I just, you know, wonder how, how one cauterizes oneself of, of that implanted bias that, you know, we, we thought was okay because it seemed so benign when we were young. And, you know, and then you go up and you realize what the, um, you know, the impact of it is. And I, you know, part of this is also a question about your parents. I mean, you, you lived, I mean, with staying at people's homes, you know, the homes of your white friends. Did your parents, was that part of your parents' teaching or um, did, is it something you had to find for yourself? Well, actually, it's interesting. It, it was a result. It was their backlash against their teaching. Being Caribbean and coming to New York, they were uh, rejected and bigoted. They were subject to bigoted treatment by black Americans who uh, made fun of their dress, their accent, the this, the that, and the other. Uh, and they looked down on, on uh, black Americans for a variety of reasons. And so they, they, in their assimilation efforts, uh, just raised us as Americans and uh, embraced the American values and, and, and didn't conscientiously try to pass their biases on. Now, they had biases, um, but they were not 
the the kind that, that that we're discussing. But every every individual at some point has to come to terms with I'm an adult. I have to be uh, I have to accept the consequences uh, and the implications of my own values and what are they? Uh, and that's what faith is about. Faith faith says that we, you come to us as imperfect beings, and now here's the standard. Here's the standard of faith, and what are you going to do to reach it? There, there are ten commandments, are not ten suggestions. They're commandments. These are things we want you to do. So, so sometimes, whether we feel it in our heart, the behavior has to at least manifest our core values. You know, you you, you said before, and I I want to return to it that, um, uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, I just noted a um, a question that was asked. Uh, is you know, right now there seems to be a, a, a sense that a lot of these protests were are, are geared or or motivated by anti law enforcement, anti police uh, feelings. You know, for you know the heinous things that have been done by by certain uh, bad policemen. Um, but the but the real issue of racism is something much greater than you know this particular. Yes, we'd like to solve that problem, but that's not the problem. Right, that's a that's in a way a, a symptom of the problem, but it's not the problem. So how do you go about doing this? Uh, and look, we we all know well we have to change our voting. We have to get certain people in office, but that's not as you said. That's not necessarily going to be uh, you know the the solution either. So let's take and put it on a very individual level. How does the individual, each of us, whoever may be listening, the people we're going to talk to? How do you start this process of changing this society? Well, uh, the, you, each of us is the CEO of the you show, uh, of <laughs> your individual show. And, and so we've got to take some ownership. Um, one of the things that I think is important, I think I've, I've heard a lot of people concerned about the looting and other people are concerned about, uh, are you against the police? No one's against, no one is for uh, anarchy or bedlam. Uh, we all want to be safe. We all want to be secure. Uh, our, the black community, many in the black community experience the police as part of our uh, threat to our safety. And so while we are against, uh, while we are for the law, we are against the lawless. And when uh, there, is no, there are no consequences for criminal behavior with a badge, then we have to speak out against that. But no one is saying it, and this whole movement to defund police departments is not is is not to disband police departments. We're right. we're clear on that distinction. The issue of racism is 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 a an American issue, and we've been grappling it with it for 400 years. Um, there are those who want to say I'm not a racist. That was 200 years ago, but 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 many have benefited from racism, and so the 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 question is. Uh, the recognition, and what are you going to do about it? No one's asking you to give up uh, your uh, portfolio, but one must at least recognize that when you face the history of America, that the history was founded on two things. We took land away from people who were here. Uh, we've, 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 we haven't exterminated them, but we have certainly committed, uh, reduced their population and then nearly annihilated them and then sequestered them on places that are called reservations. And then we went across the sea and, and brought, kidnapped another group of people and got free labor for them for 200 years. Those are historical facts. Okay. And, and uh, the results of that in any, in any settlement, if you go to court, deals with what do you do to make folk whole? Um, it can't go on forever. Can't, ask, can't get mad when people get mad because they've been mistreated. Uh, and so I think that we are looking to how do we shape Peter these conversations? Uh, how do we get in a room? And I think that that is where the faith community has has to provide greater leadership than we've been able to do. Yeah, you know. So I, if if you were to engage somebody, look, you know, this whole idea of uh, our president is. I mean, the sad thing is he's talking to forty percent of this country. That that is not is not going to agree with our particular take on what's happening. As a matter of fact, he may be a comp may be very effective in terms of what he's trying to accomplish, which is not to heal, but in fact to, to create create divides. Um, and you know, and and in that way, you know, in a, a kind of motivate a certain group of uh, this nation and this nation 
who think that just by virtue of their own whiteness, they have a certain level of superiority, uh, which of course is, you know, uh, among others, you know, the things that I think concern us both and concern should concern this nation. Um, so, uh, you know, I, um, I'm, I'm interested in, you know, look, we, we understand the defunding of public schools or the, the decrease of the funding of public schools, even to the say, you know, say some of the emergency funding should be taken away from public schools and given to private schools. That's, you know, the Secretary of Education is saying. Uh, the, 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 the lack of support of hospitals and, and, and you know, minority uh, communities. Um, the, the, the housing restrictions and the inability, you know, the reason the density of the of certain communities that has caused this virus to spread and kill as much as that. So what, what would you think of all these things that are challenges to us as our society? Uh, and I'm going to throw into the mix financial, you know, economic inequality. Which, which of these, and where do we begin? Or is it just trying to change the mindset that will change it all? Uh, well, you've, you've cataloged uh, the inequ inequities and the disparities in a kind of a comprehensive way, but at the end, at the end of the day, laws don't laws alone don't change these things. Uh, and because we've we've done we have a lot of legislation already on the book, it's still heart to heart, uh, and and the recognition that uh, that that a change is we're in the midst of a change, uh, and 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 the Wrong cannot continue as it is, uh, and 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 that is a faith statement, but it's also a, a recognition that that has some grounding in demographics uh, and some other facts. So the majority of white voters still elected voted for Donald Trump last election. The white voters, uh, white women did not. The majority of white women who voted voted against Hillary Clinton. Um, so, so elections and politics are not the salvation, I still believe, and still stand on faith. Faith is what has you and I talking right now. Faith is, has, has accomplished more than all of these other things. And so I believe that we need to be more assertive, those of us who walk in faith, need to be much more assertive slash aggressive and it has to we have to talk to congregations and fellowships and neighborhoods about being proactive and the young people are challenging that uh it's happening in schools it's happening and and, and this prairie fire that is of change uh, got the editor at the times ousted that uh the editor in philadelphia ousted all kinds of repercussions are happening now because there's a new consciousness and I think that new consciousness is going to have unpredicted uh, results, and we've got to be ready to to support those those consequences. But you know, leaders and institutions like the Y, one of the things the Y has done has brought in innovative and visionary thinkers to present ideas and concepts sometimes before their time, before they get general acceptance. And so we have to open our hearts and our minds to embrace these new ideas and at least listen to them. Well, I thank you for that advertisement for the why, and I would count you <laughs> visionary speakers before their time. Um, but uh, there, and so there's a question that was asked by one of our the people uh, attending this uh, this uh, webinar, um, which of course is one that I think we always. Um, but how? What recommendation do you have to speaking to people who vote uh, want to vote for this president for religious reasons, it, passionately anti-abortion, pro-life, for instance? Well, uh, you know, I I have to ask them: uh, are, Do they do they think the country is moving in the right direction? Uh, uh, do do how do they feel about the fact that they made that many of their neighbors are suffering? Uh, I would appeal to some of their conscience, and some of them, uh, we're, they're not going to get it today or tomorrow, but we have still have to make the appeal, uh, and the appeal without uh, castigating them. Uh, it's it's easy to condemn folk who don't think like you do. Uh, it's easy to condemn folk who don't think like you do or look like you do. Uh, but that's what faith calls us to do. Uh, it's, it's, we've made faith nearly motivational speakers periodically with some cultural trappings. 
And that's not what the essence of faith is. Faith has to be a, a way of life, and faith has to manifest in activity. And there's no faith that justifies exclus- ex- exclusion and oppression. There's no faith that does that. And so we have to rely on our faith and challenge leaders uh, and, 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 and also not take a back seat to leaders. The, I think the, the faith community has been derelict in, in our positions of uh, secular leaders, that, that, that we ask morality to take a, a back seat. And that's why we have to say it is wrong to have health disparities that result in what we've just seen. Uh, and there's a consequence to that. You know, I, uh, there are several questions that have come up, and, and what I'm going to say to our listening, uh, those who are listening, we, we started about 15 minutes late, um, and we're at the time we were supposed to end, but I, if it's okay with you and you have the time, Jacques, I'd like to continue for at least another Absolutely. 10 minutes. Okay. So um, uh, I'm going to ask my question, and I'm going to ask two that have come in. <laughs> you know, there, one thing we haven't talked about is kind of the intersection between this you know, this upheaval in terms of the, the killing of uh, a, a really an innocent man who yelled out mama, you know, and George Floyd. Um, but it was also against the backdrop of, of this uh, pandemic that has locked us in. And I'm, I'm wondering if you think there's been, and perhaps my question has a certain, um, you know, viewpoint, a, a, an increase in empathy and, and, and humility in terms of the people that we depended on, that we never really paid attention to, people, the people who were delivering food, the people who were driving trucks, the people who were the first responders, who tended not to be of our own communities. Um, but suddenly we realize how much we are reliant upon this, fu- this society of ours across all groups, all colors, all, all religions, functioning well together. Well, I, you know, um... When we, we, we gave them a collective name, uh, either first responders or essential folks. Uh, but the reality is we didn't pay them the way we said that we valued them. So we go on the balcony and clap at seven o'clock. But when the EMT folks went for their new contract, it was like, we don't have any money. Uh, when uh, just the other night, when a delivery man went uh, and was delivering food and, food and had his ID as an essential worker, he got arrested. Um, so, so I wonder about the sincerity of, uh, of of this this dimension of this moment, where it's nice to say pl- awful platitudes, but uh, where somebody said, "Show me the money." Uh, that we've got to put our resources in alignment with our values, and we have not yet been able to do that. And I, that could be one of the first lines of the struggle is to start monitoring how our resources are spent. Uh, which means, it is unco- no, I think it's unconscionable to continue on the path that we're on, and this this notion in New York about taking a billion dollars from the police department to give to youth groups and social work, I think that's revolutionary, and and that's uh, and I'm hopeful that that will lead to uh, other uh, dramatic changes. Which is in a way saying that we have to uh, do away with the notion that we could glaze our eyes could glaze over when it comes to matters of budget, you know, allocation. When it comes to uh, contract negotiations with groups that we would, you know, they'll take care of it. Meaning our elected officials, they'll take it. That that doesn't work anymore. I mean, if if we really care about changing the society, we have to care about the nitty gritty, and and pay. And attention. Peter, and, and Peter, and Peter, it's a dual care, right? When, you, when we talk about public dollars, that's one dimension, but also our dollars. Who, who, are, the, uh, who are the businesses that are supporting status quo? Um, when, when Colin Kaepernick took a knee, he was vilified and he's, his livelihood was suspended. Okay. And then when, when uh, people, peaceful demonstrators demonstrated, then it was like, oh, yeah, he was right four years ago. Uh, um, so we've got to be prepared to, to, to how do you spend your money? Now, the NFL, the reason that they came around is because some of their players came around, but also because the communities came around and that they saw their, their, their product being jeopardized. And so in addition to monitoring how the public resources are being allocated, how do you spend your money? Well, well, what, what, what businesses do you support? What, 
What, uh, where do you make your investments? Do you, what questions do we ask about those who run our portfolios or our, our pension funds? That's another dimension of activism that is going to be opening up uh, very soon. Yeah, and there was actually another uh, uh, way of activism financial aid that was given in this Chad Sanders. He said, listen, if you don't send me your, your guilt-ridden text, you want to do something, give money to pay legal fees for black people who are being arrested and imprisoned and killed or to black politicians running for office. In other words, there are pr very practical things we can do, even if we're not the uh, CEO of a corporation. I mean, Absolutely. It, you know, it, it really bothered me when the, uh, you know, the football, the NFL, was unwilling to, um, you know, talk seriously about hiring um, blacks in for senior management positions when they were making their profits on the on top of the bodies and skulls of of, of that community of, of people they who still are. They still are. There's a, another question. What change? Of, this is from our listeners. What change resulting from this movement would resonate most with the immigrant family of uh, generation of your family? What will have fulfilled their idea of America and why they struggled to come here? Thoughtful question. Uh, I, uh, yes, a very thoughtful question. I think it would be uh, access. Uh, the, the number one thing would be access to uh, college, uh, to college education. Um, I don't have to even ponder that. Um, we're, we're diminishing the amount of uh, folks who are able to get into college and the incarceration rate has decimated uh, many elements of our community, but I think the uh, the immigrant community in particular. Now, just for clarification, my family are uh, were came to New York from someplace else in America. So uh, the Caribbean, the, the Virgin Islands are American citizens. So they were citizens when they got here. Uh, but but the but their values uh, were basically immigrant values, and the, and the the point being that. To, through education, you got to work for education. It's not a gift. It's not a. Uh, but uh, education has become less attainable in recent years, and the results uh, that you can see. But they are the single. That's the single vehicle that changes paradigms. And uh, and and ideally, uh, with more doors open in more places, we'd expose young people to other young people from outside of their clan. Uh, one other question, and this will be the last one I'll ask from our um, from our uh, listeners, uh, and and then we'll just wrap it up uh, as much as I hate doing it. But you and I will have the opportunity to continue our conversation many, 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 many times mm -hmm. over. Uh, I mean, the question I think the root of the question is that in certain ways we're we're all tribal, right? You know, I we've mm -hmm. talked about the way we were raised and and our own groups. And um, you know we we like to hang out with the people that we know best. And the question is, how do you transition? How does that that tribalism uh, transition to racism? And how do you break that you know that that uh, roadmap? Well, I make the distinction: people hanging out with their own is in and of itself not a bad thing. Values are reinforced, resources are gathered. There's a synergy of culture and faith. Uh, it's when that synergy is used, when that that uh, tribalism, if you will, is used to oppress another's aspirations and dreams. That's when the problems occur. So um, I think th to recognize the roles of prejudice and and blocking opportunities for others is the uh, the crux of, of of that determination. I think also it's important to recognize that every right now. Everyone is not out marching. As, as crowded as the streets are, the aerial shots, there is another group of people, two other groups of people. There, there is, if you use the lessons of 68, there's a backlash community sitting and saying that they are threatening our way of life. Remember that after the summer of 68, that Nixon got elected. Uh, so, so, so just because the 6 o'clock and the 11 o'clock news is filled with activists, uh, that's not an accurate picture of where America is. But the other thing is that in, in speaking the black community, there are many who are seething right now. Uh, they're not just angry, they're seething. They're not marching anywhere. Uh, but they are the ones who are angry uh, about a variety of things that this perfect storm of calamity has been visited upon us, economics, health, and civil unrest. And they are the ones who we need to be mindful of because they – the, 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 they may not be in the NRA, but they have weapons. They may not, uh, they may not 
be marching down the street, but they are mad at the police. They remember stop and frisk. They remember uh, the fact that 93% of the people who were stopped for social distancing are, are black. They remember when a woman uh, didn't wear her mask and five policemen beat her in front of her five-year-old. So there is an element of anger, seediness that has not been addressed or recognized, and that is going to have to have a, a, a release if for us to, have, to make peace. We've got to uh, identify when society has been wrong, when government has been wrong, and say so, uh, because that's the start of healing, I believe. And, and how do you help release that, that anger? Um, well, one is, again, through faith. Uh, two is by listening. Uh, we don't always have to have the answer, but people need to know that they were listened to, they were heard. And uh, uh, we met recently with the police commissioner and conveyed that to you, you don't have to say everything. You have to sometimes just listen uh, and recognize that, uh, that none of us has the complete answer. But when you talk about stop and frisk, the scars are still in our community. And it wasn't government, it wasn't this administration that ended stop and frisk, the courts ended it. And so there is still a stop and frisk mentality in the New York City Police Department. It's not solely a police issue, but we need to recognize the wounds of others. Once I, once I uh, became more familiar with Jewish history in Europe, I realized that never, never again has some meaning for people who came over here during the Holocaust and were turned away at U.S. borders. It, 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 it suggests why the ideology and the practice of many leaders is so devoted to Israel in a way that others who may not understand that background don't get. And so we have to begin to listen to each other a whole lot better. And that's part of our the role as, as faith leaders to help us do that. Well, Jacques, I could listen to you forever. Uh, <laughs> I will. And uh, I just, you know, want to, uh, firstly, before I thank you, thank Tish James and Michael Schmidt, who uh, helped bring our group together. And, you know, it's just about a year. And I, as I said to you the other day, I, I, I think of you as a brother, <laughs> so even though I've only, I didn't have to live through with the first uh, whatever years of what we uh, but um, I, I, uh, I think that we are, I, I want to believe, because I am a, a person of faith, that we are at a, a pivotal time in our nation's history, and that um, I, am, I am grateful for your sharing your heart with us uh, today, uh, as you have always done with me personally. And I, I want to thank our listeners who stayed, who stuck with us despite our technical difficulties. And um, you know what, we may have to have you back for chapter two. Uh, so much more to talk about. So Jacques, thank you so much. And to uh, those of you who are still online with us, thank you uh, for, for, for staying with us. And hopefully together we can, you know, I believe we can make this world better. Peter, to you and the Y, keep up the good work. Thank you for having me. And uh, I believe that together we can prove that the skeptics are wrong and that the best is yet to come. God bless you. I'll walk side by side with you on that track. Take care, everybody. Thank you. God bless.